My name is Navdej Purewal, and I'm the Deputy Director of the South Asia Institute here at SOAS. And it is a real pleasure to be able to welcome you all here tonight to the first Noor Inayat Khan Annual Lecture. The South Asia Institute at SOAS was launched two years ago and has approximately 65 academic members, all working on a wide range of areas um, which pertain to the region of South Asia. Uh, we host, including tonight, a dynamic schedule events throughout the year, foster students' engagement with the region through teaching and research, liaise with universities and partners in South Asia, and act as a significant gateway between the region of South Asia and SOAS here in London. Tonight's lecture comes out of a partnership between SOAS and the Noor Nayat Khan Trust. This is a very organic partnership in that we have mutual interests in critical thinking, promoting progressive approaches to gender and responding to cutting edge issues and developments on South Asia and its global dimensions. Tonight's speaker, Rinda Grover, is an excellent example of this in not only reflecting the ethos of Noor, but also the ethos of SOAS for the ways in which she has spoken up and defended civil liberties in India at the most critical of times over the past few decades, when others were often silent through her knowledge, integrity, professionalism, and commitment to social and legal justice. So we are absolutely delighted to have her speaking here tonight at our first Noor Inayat Khan annual lecture. I will now pass on the stage to Shravani Basu, who is not only the author of the widely acclaimed biography of Noor Spy Princess, but is also a trustee of the Noor Inayat Khan Trust and one of the main drivers of this event tonight. So she'll be introducing our speaker and chair moderator. Thank you, Navtej. It's been a real pleasure uh, for the Noor Inayat Khan Memorial Trust to work with Michael and you from, the, from SOAS, from the South Asia Institute. We've had a good time discussing the problems of the world over lots of good green tea made by Michael. Michael, where are you? <laughs> Sitting there, oh, there you are. So thank you for that. Um, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for making it here today. Um, I know you're going to have a very, very exciting evening. It's great to see many familiar faces and some new ones. And uh, for those of you who don't know much about Noor Inayat Khan uh, or the Trust, I'll just take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about her. You can see her picture there, very tiny image. Um, but who was Noor Inayat Khan? She was a secret agent in the Second World War. She was the first woman radio operator to be dropped behind enemy lines in France. She was uh, just 28 at the time. She went in there with a false passport, a couple of francs, and a pistol. And, um, well, her previous life, she was, a, she was a writer, a musician, so this was a sea change for her. But she worked fiercely and fearlessly in one of the most dangerous areas of the field in Germany. But she was, uh, she was working as a radio operator. She was working single-handed. But she was betrayed. She was captured, tortured, and killed in Dachau concentration camp. She was posthumously awarded the George Cross, which is the highest civilian honor that Britain gives, and France honored her with the Croix de Guerre. But over the years, we felt her story had been lost. So my personal journey with Noor uh, began when I started researching her life, and I wrote the biography. And then, I mean, that was, I thought that was it. I'd done the book. But I started receiving so many letters from people. And they were all saying, thank you for the book. Thank you for bringing her story alive. And uh, what do we do? How do we keep her memory alive? Um, so I felt this responsibility. There was a man who said she should be on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. And I said, oh, well, that's a nice thought. Um, there was another man who offered um, to write every day to the prime minister, bless him, and, uh, you know, campaign for something for her. So I felt, you know, I've got to do something. And uh, so I called on my friends, as one does. You've seen them all around today. We call them Team Noor, Noor's Angels. And, um, we decided to campaign for a memorial for Noor because Noor lived not far away from here. She lived on Taverton Street, um, just down the road. As a child, she lived on Gordon Square, number 29, where they'd have music evenings. And um, we decided this, there should be a memorial in Gordon Square where she played as a child. 
So after a two-year campaign, to cut a long story short, the Nurinath Khan Memorial was unveiled in um, Gordon Square. Give me a minute, if all goes well. Yes, so this is the memorial. Some of you may have seen it. If you haven't seen it, do go and have a look. It's visited by people from around the world. There's always lovely messages, lovely flowers, and it was uh, unveiled by Princess Anne, as you can see. So um, that was a lovely, you know, a really uh, precious moment for all of us. And um, this had set the ball rolling. We got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of responses, and then there was a letter one day that, from the Royal Mail, and they said, we want to uh, honor Noor for her centenary with the first class stamp. And we said, yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, I think the campaign and the awareness was spreading, which was wonderful. But then as you can see, this team Noor is a very restless team. And we said, we've got to do something more, something more tangible um, for the young generation, because this is what it's all about, isn't it? Uh, we thought we'd partner with SOAS, and we awarded a Noor Prize for a dissertation for a postgraduate student. And last year, we gave our first award. So this year, we are, I'm very proud to announce that the recipient of the Noor Inayat Khan Dissertation Award is Natasha Pagarani. Uh, she isn't here, but she sent us a little clip. So have a look. I wrote my dissertation about the new mental health bill that will shortly be enacted into law in India. In my research, I focused on the ways in which mental health laws have been used to remove the personal liberties of women who are deemed by others to not conform to feminine behaviour and not to be fulfilling their gendered roles in society. I wanted to emphasise that this does not only happen to some other woman and is not limited to the spaces within health institutions. Rather, it permeates throughout every woman's interactions in public and private spaces and affects how a woman thinks about herself within her own mind. So I really think that the struggle to secure the rights of women and men who may be affected at some point in their lives by mental health laws is integral to the wider goal of making society a more accepting place where everyone can have the freedom to flourish in their own ways. I have now been in India for the past couple of months working for a foundation that gives grants to NGOs that specifically work with people on the margins of society. And I really thank the Noor Niyat Khan Trust for having established this award because I can't emphasize enough how encouraging it is to receive this prize at this critical stage as I put into practice some of the perspectives and ideas that I've gained through my time at SOAS. Um, so thank you so much and I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you, it's wonderful to see uh, students you know, benefiting from this and Noor's legacy sort of carrying on. And so to come to today's main event, the first of the Liberté series of talks. Now, why Liberté? Because this is what Noor Inayat Khan shouted when the SS officer, a very sadistic man, uh, pointed his, bullet, uh, his gun at her forehead and executed her. She went down screaming Liberté so he could not defeat her spirit. Today we live in troubled times. Religious fundamentalism is on the rise. Walls are being built against refugees. And let's not forget, Noor was a refugee when she came from France. She joined all the refugees and came to Britain and volunteered for the war effort. Well, communities are being divided. Free speech is taking a bantering. Now more than ever, the principles that Noor Inayat Khan stood for, peace, religious harmony, and freedom, are becoming more relevant. As far-right groups, as neo-Nazi groups rise across Europe, it's time to remember that Noor made the ultimate sacrifice of her life fighting against fascism. And who today can capture Noor's spirit of seeking freedom and justice than our speaker this evening, Brinda Grover. Brinda has been in the forefront of the struggle for human rights in India. She's fought for women's rights, for the voiceless and the underprivileged. In her position as an advocate of the Supreme Court of India, she has helped write law, was active in the change of law following the Delhi rape case, and has been listed by Time magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. Brinda lives in Delhi, and it's a rare privilege and an honor to be able to welcome her today to deliver the first Nurinath Khan Memorial Talk, the Liberté series, in this august surrounding. Chairing this event will be another fiery woman. Yes, we are very partial to our women. Um, journalist, Razia Iqbal. Razia, where are you? 
Um, Razia needs no introduction in the UK. You have all seen her on BBC television. You've heard her on BBC Radio 4 and the World Service tackling all the important issues of the day. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hand together for a very warm London SOAS welcome for Brinda Grover and Razia Iqbal. Welcome. Um, the way this is going to go uh, this evening, um, well, first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's fantastic to see such a, a, a full lecture hall. Um, Vrinda is going to uh, speak for about 45 minutes, and then I'm going to ask her some questions, and then you're going to get the chance to ask some questions. So um, I know it's a big lecture hall, but we're going to try and make this as intimate as possible. Vrinda, thank you. While she's making her way to the podium, if you can turn your phones off, that would be amazing. Yeah, thanks. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed an honor and privilege to be here to address all of you on the occasion of the Noor Inayat Khan first memorial lecture. I congratulate the Noor Trust and SOAS on this very important collaboration. And a special thank you to Shrabani for introducing me, as I'm sure many of you, to Noor through her book, A Spy Princess. So why would we be talking of Noor today and how would I see the lecture today in the context of who Noor was what she stood for, and what was the spirit of Noor. I would see Noor as somebody who, in a very strategic and determined way, resisted fascism, and eventually was killed for the principles that she stood for. And what I'm going to try and do today is to actually map a few cases and detail them for you. These cases are cases that I've personally, or campaigns that I've personally been involved in, either as a litigator or as an activist. And I would also see these women actually in many ways as carrying forward the legacy of Noor, and as being those who carry the spirit and the courage and the conviction that Noor has embodied. As Shrabni mentioned, yes, these are difficult times, they are troubled times, perhaps across the globe, definitely in India. My uh, talk will obviously be located only in India, but I think it has resonance across the world today. And I think we also need, in order to keep our own work moving forward, we need role models. We need icons. We need women role models. And I think Noor provides us that hope and that courage with which we can look forward. There is a lot of discussion, reportage today on what is happening in the US and what are the new policies that are coming out, what are the executive orders that are coming out, they're a source of much debate and discussion. SOAS would probably not be the correct place to say this because there is an avid interest in South Asia here. But I think it would be important and it would be necessary for a greater curiosity from the global north towards the global south, both because there are many things that are happening across continents where governments and states are working together and perhaps we need to also be forming different kinds of alliances to be together in this. 
And therefore, I will today talk of some of the cases that I think have reason to be discussed in terms of uh, what are the, wh where are women at the forefront of human rights struggles in India. I also say this because I think very often when we look from the outside, we see women only as victims. And we see them as those upon whom violence has been inflicted. In my own capacity as a lawyer, I have found that whenever a woman has stepped forward, even if it is to take a case to court, I have never and cannot think of it as a passive act of a victim. I think it is a moment where that woman has taken a step to challenge many uh, hurdles as well as to stake her claim to rights and justice. And I don't think, and I think we therefore need to view those women very differently. So I'm going to, through this, also try to see what is the tension that exists between democracy and different kinds of issues that are emerging. Impunity, of course, is a running theme, but impunity also changes its, co its contours. It's not the same. And I think we need to recognize the difference in order to be able to uh, have an appropriate response to it. India claims itself to be the largest democracy, while the US claims itself to be the greatest democracy. <laughs> and uh, you know, those are, those are claims that are made at least by the government of India every time it has anything to answer in the Human Rights Council or any, in any such international fora. I think being largest is more a descriptive uh, st uh, phrase uh, rather than any particular attribute that we can attach to it. We're also living in a time where, and in, I speak this definitely from our experience of many, many years in India, where hate works, hate wins. And I think there is a challenge today to the form of electoral democracy, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that we abandon it, but I am suggesting that we question it. Where polarization and engineering and mobilization of hate between communities in India for certain will win elections hands down. And it's not something new that has happened with this government. In 1984, with the anti-Sikh massacre, the Congress government at that time under Rajiv Gandhi won a majority in the Indian parliament that has never ever been won by a single party. In Gujarat, post the 2002 anti-Muslim program, the Narendra Modi government, who was then the chief minister of Gujarat, won two successive elections. I'm now going to come to a case of seven women from, can we switch that on? From uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is a state in the north of India, close to Delhi where I live. As India was going to the 2014 general elections, once again, the tried and tested method of polarization, mobilization of hate, and communal rioting and communal violence was adopted, and it did yield the desired results. And therefore, I think we need to think very carefully that what is the relationship between electoral democracy and communal, communalism and communal violence. September 2013, in western Uttar Pradesh, which is two districts, majorly a district called Muzaffarnagar, a largely rural district, where large-scale rioting began in early September 2013. It was the dominant Jat Hindu community which attacked the Muslim community in the rural areas. It resulted in perhaps the largest conflict-driven rural displacement where about 500,000 people were overnight 
rendered homeless, and a very large ghetto of only Muslims today exists in certain parts of Western Uttar Pradesh and only Hindus in the villages, where, which were the ancestral homes of these Muslim families also. As has now been seen and documented, as part of this kind of communal violence, we see a targeting of the bodies of women, both in a sexualized way as well as the humiliation of the, uh, of the entire community to whom they belong or from where they come. This has been seen across communal riots and has now even led to convictions to establish that yes, it is for, that there is a feature of communal violence where women's bodies are targeted. What we did see in September 2013 is that at least seven of these women and many, many more were gang raped and the article whose the, uh, picture we see here actually documents these gang rapes, but seven of them came forward and said they wanted to go to court against the men who had raped them. When these women came to my office, it was a very different experience and I would like to believe that there were echoes of what happened in December 2012, and I mean the protests that took over, and the large-scale protests by women and young people and others seeking a change, and the cry for justice, which followed the brutal gang rape of uh, a young woman in Delhi. When those women came, these are uneducated women from rural backgrounds, they all came with their husbands. When they sat and told me what had happened, the husband stand, stu uh, sat beside her, which was very unusual. I had not seen this happen. The husband said he was going to support her. When we talk about breaking silence, removing stigma, one could see that turn taking place and perhaps the echoes of what was happening in Delhi had reached even in rural areas. And I say this because I think somewhere in the global imagination, we have, con you know, there's, a, there's talk about rape and sexual violence, but it's confined only in certain kinds of, of, uh, uh, of contours when people look at India and people look at Delhi. These women filed FIRs in which they named the men. These men were not faceless, nameless mobs who come uh, during a communal riot. They knew the men. The men belonged to their village. These were men with whom they had had economic and social relations. Six of the women were from the same village. Not that women from other villages were not gang raped. They were all cases of gang rape. But even here, it's because they knew each other they gave confidence to each other to come forward and report. It's very difficult to be in a refugee status as an internally displaced person and then to go out and uh, uh, go, to the, uh, go to the police station and lodge a complaint. The fact that they were in a group which knew each other helped them move forward. I filed a writ in the Supreme Court of India and we did find the Supreme Court being attentive I would not say that they were sensitive. I think the Supreme Court, like many other courts, needs to work much more on understanding what feminist jurisprudence is. But it was attentive. It was attentive because post-December 2012, the issue of sexual violence on women had dominated the public discourse. The court gave some relief. The court gave asked for statements to be recorded before a magistrate as per law. One of the women's FIR, the first information report, had not been recorded. The court directed that. For the first time in India, without even the charge sheet having been filed, compensation was given, monetary compensation, which is a, not a substitute for reparation, but it was a very small step forward. Because usually women, when they make a claim, 
an accusation of rape, they are seen as liars and therefore compensation is not given till the end of a trial. And security was given. No arrests were made. A very peculiar statement was made on behalf of the state that every time the police went to the village to arrest the accused, the women and children of the village stood in front and wouldn't let the police arrest them. I don't remember, I can show you many, many visuals of the Indian police. I don't remember them being helpless. <laughs> it was only after the directions of the Supreme Court that the first few arrests were made. Almost a year passed and no charge sheet was filed. I went back to the Supreme Court and filed a contempt petition in September of 2014. The law, incidentally, in India, when it was changed in 2013, said that once a charge sheet is filed, a rape trial will be over in two months. We didn't have a charge sheet. Again, as soon as the contempt petition was, for, was, was uh, filed, the state moved and the, the uh, charge sheets were filed. A provision that was brought in through the Criminal Law Amendment Act 2013 about which we don't talk enough, a new provision was added of rape during communal or sectarian violence, recognizing that this is a kind of sexual violence that is perpetrated in India. It's a powerful section which creates a rebuttable presumption against the accused if a woman can show that there was sexual intercourse and that she was raped during a communal violence, then the question of consent would not emerge in those circumstances. So if the woman would step into the witness box and testify, the chances of the man being convicted for rape during communal violence are fairly good. And then began the whole process of intimidation, threats, coercion, pressure, on the women. Elders of the community were in conversation with each other in which, of course, the women had no part to play. I went to court. I remember this is a, a trial court in Muzaffarnagar. It's about a three and a half hour run by road from Delhi. It's a very quaint, old building which is turned into a district court. And although three and a half hours away from Delhi, you would imagine that the law is different, where very basic premises like having an in-camera proceeding that the, there are other people are not present in the courtroom when the woman testifies or that her identity is not disclosed was not at all the legal process. In fact, they put the photograph of the woman on the file, just in case you, don't, you can't guess. And it's, it's, a, it's a penal offense in India to disclose the identity of the woman unless she wishes to. For the first time, perhaps in all over almost 28 years of my practice as a lawyer, I asked for police protection when I went there. Because if you were to visit Muzaffarnagar, it would not take you very long to imagine that, yes, somebody will stroll in, and if they don't like what the witness is saying, they will just use a gun and get rid of you. And this is not an imagination. I'm not given to being fearful or an alarmist. These are things that are reported in the paper about what happens there and particularly when you are up against a very powerful dominant community. I went to court with the woman who was ready to testify. Her case had reached the stage of evidence. And on a very flimsy ground, an adjournment was sought by the accused. I pleaded with the court and said, these are delaying tactics. There is pressure on the woman. Please do not allow an adjournment. We filed an affidavit of hers where she stated that I'm under pressure. There are threats being brought on my family. I want to testify at the earliest. The court adjourned the matter. We went back the next month, and the same excuse was used by the accused. And we again pleaded. And she herself said, please record my evidence. The law says you must record her evidence if she has come to court the court again adjourned the matter. When it came up in October of 2015, she did not contact me. She went to court 
And she said, yes, I was gang raped during the communal riot, but I can't recognize the men who did it. It is not a case of, of institutional apathy that we are watching here. These are cases of institutional complicity. And I think that is where the legal system will now have to give answers. These women staked everything, including the lives of their children and themselves, in order to go to court. And it was extremely unusual for women from there to step forward and demand justice. There is one case which still survives. One woman died in childbirth before she could testify. Out of the six cases, two cases have resulted in acquittals. One woman is still fighting her case. In order to ensure that she is not threatened and she is not coerced into resiling from her statement, we have relocated her outside the state of Uttar Pradesh. I have filed a transfer petition for her case to be transferred to some other district so that she can go there and depose. And I think it's important to understand that it's not easy for these people to approach the court. Where do you get the resources to go to the Supreme Court of India for a, to file a petition and then to file a contempt petition? It seems as though the law seems to assume that they will be able to uh, fight their case. And I know that in India, at least, the UNDP spends a lot of money on what has been called millions uh, of uh, rupees have been spent on what is called access to justice, which I think is a complete misnomer. What we're talking about is, ac is access to courts. Justice is another matter here. But even that access to courts is not available. A special public prosecutor was appointed in this case. In all riot-related cases, acquittals have taken place, including in murder cases. The special public prosecutor is now being examined on charges of corruption. A designated fast-track court was set up. These are demands that we make. A special investigation cell was constituted. The designated fast-track court did not have a judge for more than six months. If this is the manner in which the system is going to respond, then we will not see women coming forward. It is not a burden for women to carry to go to a system that is inaccessible, that is hostile to them. And why I'm talking about these cases is also because everybody is only obsessed and talks about that one gang rape case of December 2012. I am not in any way saying that that's not an important case to talk about. But I, we should make it the benchmark of what should be made available to women and not treat it as the exception. And the media does that all the time, including global media. I don't remember any politician talking about these women and their right to justice, even as everybody uses the issue of sexual violence against women in India as a point in a speech or as a slogan. But until we are going to be able to break the very false dichotomy that exists between what we call ordinary times rape and extraordinary times rape, I don't think we are going to get justice in either of them. Because the system does not change. When in an extraordinary time, the, the FIR is not lodged or the medical evidence is not collected, the same policeman does not acquire a different sensibility or skill when we talk of the ordinary times of rape. I'm now going to move to a very different part of India, which holds a very special place, which holds a very special place for me, and that is Chhattisgarh, because I learned a lot of my political lawyering 
at Chhattisgarh. It's been the, the birthplace of very, very significant movements. But today in Chhattisgarh, what we see is a very targeted attack on Adivasis, who are the indigenous populations, who are resisting the acquisition of their natural resources. There are very many women and women defenders and women activists, academics, lawyers, journalists, as well as women from the indigenous population who are leading these protests. The picture you see here is of a woman called Soni Sodi, who first had to suffer. I, I remember when I met her for the first time, I was told she has been arrested. She, she, was, she had rushed to Delhi, escaped to Delhi to file a case before the Supreme Court saying she's going to be implicated in false cases. Before she could move the court, she was arrested by the police and produced. When I went to represent her, she said to me, don't let them take me to Chhattisgarh. I am willing to go to jail in Delhi. Don't allow them to take me. The law doesn't allow you that. She was taken. She was sexually tortured. Stones were inserted into her private parts, which was confirmed by a government hospital. Her petition saying that this was done under a very senior police officer has yet to be disposed of by the Supreme Court of India. The senior police officer in, uh, who she accused was in the meanwhile given the president's gallantry award. She then became a leader in her own right, implicated in seven cases, has been acquitted in six of them, and is today in Bastar exposing all manner of human rights violations from extrajudicial killings to rapes. Women activists have gone into the interiors of the villages. And what is happening here today is that because there is a resistance, one resistance which is of the population, and one resistance which is an armed Maoist resistance. Therefore, in order to have a counterinsurgency operation, you have a very, very large force, security forces being present there. In search and cordon operations, Rapes, killings are normal. Courts are silent because courts perhaps think they should be pragmatic and national security concerns, concerns of growth, economic growth, must overwhelm them and they should allow the state and security forces to do their work. In January this year, there was a small breakthrough when the National Human Rights Commission finally responded to complaints filed for over a year by saying, yes, women have been raped by security forces confirmed by their investigation. That there are civil vigilante mobs which are working in tandem with the administration, particularly the police, and these These people were targeting all the women whose names are here. One is an academic, another is a lawyer, and Manish Kunjam is again an Adivasi leader, all of whom, except for Soni Sodi and Manish Kunjam, who belong to the area, were forced, forced to leave and threatened that they would be, harm would be brought to them. And it was only after a lot of protest as the, as the poster says, on 30th of January this year, that finally the police officer, the inspector general of police of the area, was asked to proceed on long leave because all the accusations made by the activists were against him. I, for one, as a lawyer, fail to understand that how can proceed on long leave be any form of penalty to anybody? <laughs> we are talking about the inspector general of police of an area who has been accused of murder, of rape, extrajudicial killings. And all that he's asked to do is to proceed on long leave because the morale of the security forces must be upheld, while the morale 
of the citizens is totally ruined. Bela Bhatia has gone back to Bastar and she has said she will not leave. She's an academic. She did her PhD from Cambridge. She says she will stay there. She will document the violations and she will not leave. This is a press conference that was held. There's Professor Nandani Sundar, again, a very, very renowned academic who works extensively against whom murder charges have been lodged by the same police officer. I'm going to move to extrajudicial killings don't take place only in Bastar. They take place in many parts of India, and they were not invented by the Modi government. The Congress earlier, every state government and central government has used them. It was used against the Naxals in the state of Andhra Pradesh, against the Naxals in the state of West Bengal, and against the Sikh militants in the state of Punjab in the 80s. But I'm going to refer to one case because I think we need to talk about it. This is the case of a young woman whose picture we see there, Ishrat Jaha, murdered in June of, 20, of 2004. The details are all available. I have a very long interview given to a web magazine called The Wire. I'm short of time, so I'm not going to go into the details. Suffice it to say that there were a series of encounters. This is a term that we love. It, it has no meaning in law, but we use it all the time a series of encounters in India, particularly in the state of Gujarat, where Muslims were targeted and killed. Investigations monitored by the court showed that this too was a fake encounter, which means it was a murder. Four people killed by the Gujarat, very senior Gujarat police officers. The investigation records Statements of police officers who can be the only eyewitness to this, saying that yes, these people were taken into illegal detention, held for two days, and then killed in cold blood. I represent the mother of Ishrat Jaha, Shamima Kosar. Shamima Kosar is a very poor woman. She has seven children to bring up. Her husband died. When her, the day her daughter was killed, she was so poor, she did not have a television in her house. And when journalists arrived, she couldn't understand what they were talking about. She, her, this daughter had stepped up to earn. She would usually take tuitions. It was summer vacation time, so she had taken a job outside. In June 2004, the daughter was killed. And in August 2004, Shamima Kosar filed a writ petition saying, I know my daughter is not a terrorist. And I want to know who killed her and why, and whoever has killed her must be punished. I have never understood, and I believe that there is no, you, there's no, it's not rationality that can explain the courage of someone like Shamima Kosar, knowing fully well that she was taking on very powerful policemen and police officers in Gujarat. The investigation then led, and of course at that time then the trail has gone cold, Further investigation has not happened, and the timing of it explains it all. It showed that the intelligence bureau officers were involved. They have also been charge sheeted. But the trail also hinted very clearly, and this is evidence on record, I speak from the charge sheet, that the then chief minister of Gujarat and the home minister of Gujarat, who are now the prime minister and the president of the ruling party, gave the final nod for this killing. This happened in 2004. The trial has not begun yet. All the police officers who were arrested have been enlarged on bail. I arrived here on 4th and 3rd February. I'd moved a petition in the Supreme Court. One of the accused has now been made the Director General of Police of Gujarat. All the witnesses in this case are subordinate police officers. I wouldn't hold my breath to figure out where this case would go. But if you speak to Shamima Kosar, she says, I'm waiting for justice. I want to know who killed my daughter. How does the state respond to this? There is not even an attempt being made anymore to say this is not a staged encounter or a fake encounter. We are told she was a terrorist, and so she was eliminated. And that's not something that is peculiar to India. I think that's happening in many, many parts of the world now. And we are allowing fear, anxiety, to actually allow us to agree to these arguments. 
So we had to ask that, and, and all kinds of very, very dubious evidence, which I don't have time, and if, if during the, the conversation I can read out some of that, as to how do we know that she's a terrorist. All investigation has exonerated her from having any terror links whatsoever. And if that doesn't sway the public mood, we are told, what was this unmarried young woman doing with three men in a car? If an unmarried young woman is seen in a car with three men, I think she should be shot dead. That comes from a party that gives the slogan, and I was asked this on the radio by a caller two days ago, yesterday, gives the slogan, Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, which means save the daughter, educate the daughter. As a matter of fact, she was not in a car with three men, she was in a car with one man with whom she was working. And that's what working women do, they go out. I don't think I have time, so maybe when, during the conversation, I would have only wanted to mention one more woman who's also called the Iron Lady of Kashmir. In Kashmir, not only do we have laws of colonial origin which perpetuate the power and privilege of the armed forces, but also the immunity and the impunity that it, it engenders. Parveena Hangar's young son was disappeared in 1991 by security forces. A judicial inquiry names three army officers. She filed a writ in the Kashmir High Court. And the court said, yes, these men must be prosecuted. The government of India, with the power that it has under a law called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act and other laws which actually give the same immunity, said that they were not giving sanction to prosecute uh, those army officers. And since then, she turned her grief into a movement. And in 1994, since 1994, she has got together all parents, wives, children of those who have been disappeared. And they have formed an organization called the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. And they're seeking that their children be returned, the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances be ratified, and enforced disappearances be made a crime so that it can be probed into. At the moment, all the complaints are lodged either as missing or abduction or kidnapping. And in the official archive, there is gradual erasure of the crime of enforced disappearances. I will end here by only adding that in India, the threat to fundamental freedoms and civil liberties is very, very severe. It's not just those who are targeted, but lawyers, activists are being targeted either through laws like the FCRA or through implicating them in false criminal cases. And there is a determined effort to silence those who will dissent and to silence those who will oppose and who will uphold civil liberties. There's much talk across the globe today of the executive ban order of Trump and it is being opposed and the courts have said that they will not allow for this ban, at least for the moment. Let's see what happens in, in the appeals courts. In the Lok Sabha, the Indian government has just introduced an amendment to the Citizenship Act. It says that if Hindus, Christians, Jains, Sikhs, Buddhists, from any of the three neighboring countries, which is Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Afghanistan were to want to come to India and stay there and be naturalized as citizens, they will not be called illegal migrants. The time period for their naturalization will be halved because India should be the home where people who originally were Hindus 
should all be allowed to come back. In the Indian subcontinent in South Asia, there are other persecuted, very severely persecuted minorities like the Rohingya Muslims, the Ahmadiyyas. This will not be available to them. The conceptualization of the nation as belonging to one religion, to one race, which is pure, and this is the motherland. The, the, the idea of India as opposed to the Hindu Rashtra is being slipped in. And somewhere the story of India's economic growth, which as the Adivasis of Chhattisgarh would tell you is on their, is being built on their corpses, is not evoking the kind of critique and criticism that it should. And at this juncture, we need to have alliances globally. To go back to Noor, Noor was opposing fascism because it was wrong. And she said that after that, she may well go back to seeking the liberty for India. And I think this is a juncture when globally we will have to decide what are the alliances against this form of, and fascism may not come back in the same uniform, but it will come in very different ways and different uh, incarnations. And how do we stand up together and oppose them and carry forward, like these brave women, the legacy of Noor? Thank you very much.